So thanks for coming to the class. Uh, so that's on water smart landscaping. The main three points that we're going to cover is using water wisely, uh, ways to do that within the yard to absorb and um, absorb runoff and, and the rain. Uh, building good soils to help roots soak into the ground or help roots grow into the ground and get rain to soak in and selecting proper plants to thrive in your yard's various conditions. So I'm, my name is Greg uh, Thompson. During my day job, I'm a water resources specialist with the City of Egan Lakes and Wetlands Program. I'm a Bloomington resident. I've li lived here for um, 10 years, something I think like that. Uh, originally, I'm from South Dakota. I grew up on a farm out by the Mitchell area, if you're any of you familiar with the Corn Palace. I grew up out, out there. Um, but during the evenings and weekends, I'm a volunteer with the Bush Lake chapter of the Isaac Walton League, which is a conservation organization. Uh, we've had a, the property on Bush Lake out at the end of Isaac Walton Road since the uh, 1930s. And it's awesome. I, I lived there for eight years. I was the caretaker. There's a little cabin there. It's, it's so spectacular. Of as I came from the country, moving to the city, I moved to downtown Minneapolis. And that was quite a, quite a shock, um, just a, quite a change for me. But then ultimately, I moved into this place, and it's like living up north. It's just beautiful. If any of you haven't been out to Bush Lake, you got to go out there. It's a beautiful lake, super uh, high water quality, because uh, it's been really protected around the drainage area uh, for it. But anyway, uh, we're out there. Rainfall, uh, average rainfall in the United States little color-coded map and they say by zip code, but uh, really the, the thing to look for is this blue, the darker blue colorations and the lighter it gets, the less annual rainfall. So in the United States, it's down really in the south, gets a lot of rainfall, and then up in the Pacific Northwest, a lot. Then as you start getting up here, uh, Minnesota, or specifically in the Twin Cities, we get about 32 inches of annual precipitation. Where I grew up in South Dakota, we were like 20 inches, 22 inches of annual precipitation. We thought Minnesota was like a tropical rainforest compared to where we were at. You know, it just seemed like they're always getting rain. And I move here, oh, it's always dry, it never rains. But um, there's quite a bit of variability, but this is sort of where it falls out in, in average. Um, it's just how we, how we deal with that rain. A lot of times water just runs off as, as, as soon as it's falling on the ground, it's, it's flowing off and we just sort of lose that rain advantage, don't give it a chance to soak in. Uh, and then we have to water a lot to make up for it. So with water smart landscaping, this is just one method and so this is on the cover of the, of the This was what a homeowner did. This is in, in Bloomington, just west of here, like five blocks away. Uh, they had water that was coming off of the roof and then off of the driveway was just going right out to the street. And then they were having to water a lot uh, to keep areas alive, plants alive. So what they did, um, they had their, were having their driveway redone anyway because the asphalt was just shot. It was at the end of its useful life. So they slightly regraded the asphalt so the driveway pitched off to the side dug down a shallow depression along the side to take that driveway water in here and then they redirected their downspout which before was hooked onto the driveway to just run that way, redirected it so it flows through a little dry creek bed, installed these little um, stone um, check dams or little weirs, what the engineers call them, just to slow the water flow down but water will ultimately come this way and then out towards the street. Uh, but it gives it a chance to soak in there. That was right after planting. And then, uh, so it was a bunch of native plants within here, some blue flag irises and some others, and we'll go through plants in a little bit. But then right out at the edge of the driveway, instead of doing traditional Kentucky bluegrass, which has a really shallow root system, they use pine fescues, which have a much deeper root system, 9 to 12 inches deep. So that's a lot more drought tolerant of a lawn grass. And that was it, um, I think a year, that was the second growing season. It's doing very, uh, very well. 
Uh, so every home has an impact on stormwater runoff, a typical uh, rooftop driveway lawn situation. In, so in Egan, I've got the, all these measurements in Egan, but it's pretty much the same in Bloomington. A typical rooftop can shed about 1,700 gallons of water in a one-inch rainfall. And 90% of our rain events in Minnesota or in the Twin Cities are one inch or less. And so we'll eventually, you know, we periodically have these big rain events, but most of them are smaller events. So we look a lot at the uh, one inch rain event. So 1,700 gallons of water coming off, off of a typical driveway, about 1,200 gallons of water coming off. If a person has compacted lawn, just really rock hard, hard soils underneath the lawn surface, that can be shedding a lot of water as well, potentially 4,500 gallons of water coming off of the lawn. So in, the, in a one inch rainfall, just a regular residential property could be shedding about 7,000 gallons of water coming off of it. Uh, over the course of a year, that's 220,000 gallons of water coming off. Uh, soil compaction is the biggest issue with lawns and lawn health. A lot of, uh, so I, I should mention, uh, Back in the, I went to school for landscape architecture and graduated about 18 years ago and then went into residential landscaping. And we did new home construction mostly, western suburbs, southwest. Um, and we were, so new home construction, we'd be the last contractor in, soils were rock hard, all the other contractors had been driving over it. We'd come in, we'd just throw sod over the top of it, trench in an irrigation system and then crank up the irrigation and walk away. And in, in case to, to put in the plants, the larger shrubs, the trees, we would use a big auger on the front of our skid loader to bore the hole because it took too long to dig it with a shovel because it was just so rock hard. Drop the plants in, just irrigate the heck out of it. And it's not a very sustainable system. You shut off the irrigation, those plants are dead. We could go back and do sod repairs, say they had an area of sod that died off, and you, a couple years later you could just lift the sod right back off because it just could not root into that soil below. Uh, so testing for soil compaction is a, it's a, it's a great step to eventually getting to a healthy lawn situation where a lawn that could exist without irrigation. So what we do in the city, or, uh, we use a soil compaction meter. It's this probe that's about three feet long. We push it into the soil. It gives us a readout of how compacted the soil is. What a homeowner can do, or it's a super low-tech method, you get a wire flag like a utility locate flag and keep it nice and straight. You want to, if there's any bends in the wire, you want to take those out. Keep it nice and straight, hold the wire really firm about four or five inches off of the bottom of the wire and start pushing it into your yard or into the lawn once, once frost is gone, obviously. And so you push it in the lawn and see how far down you can push it. If you can only push it a couple of inches and then it's, you just can't go anymore, you've got some shallow compaction issues. If you can sink the flag all the way down, which a lot of people can, especially in lawns that haven't had construction equipment across them in the last 20 years, 25 years, it's possible you can sink the thing all the way down. Then you don't have a compaction issue. You, you don't have to worry so much about should I do a core plug aerator, you know, what, what should I do? You might have, if your lawn is browning out in areas where you can sink that flag all the way down, you have some moisture holding issues. That it's just that soil that's there is not able to hold on to the rain that comes through it. So then there's some other things that you do. But with the wire flag, you can also feel the soil texture. You can push it down. You can feel the, the sand, like sand grains against it if you've got sandy soils. Or if you don't feel anything, if it's really soft, then you've got a clay, but typically you can't push that thing into a clay when it's dry. So anyway, with soil types, so our main mineral soil types, sands or clays, sands naturally can infiltrate 13 inches up to 20 inches of water per hour, so we get a big rain event, that can absorb it in naturally. Uh, if it has, if it's non-compacted, if it's got root systems that extend down into the soil, you can compact sand by just driving equipment over it, skid loader, whatever, constant foot traffic over a specific spot, and then it reduces the infiltration rate down to 1.4 inches per hour, or potentially one inch per hour. With clay soils, those can naturally infiltrate almost 10 inches of water per hour if they've got root systems in the soil and organic matter in the soil. That gets stripped off. The organic matter gets stripped off when sites are developed. They take off the top layer. They'll bring in topsoil, and we did this in the landscaping business. We didn't care where we were getting the stuff from. We were calling it topsoil. If it just sort of looked sort of darker color, that's cool. We dump it over and we drive over it with our skid loader to level it out. If it had a clay content at all, we just made rock hard soils again on top of rock hard soils. 
But so the clays can get compacted down so they can only infiltrate 0.2 or 0.02 inches per hour. So it doesn't take much of a rainfall to just max out what the clay can take and then everything else is just going off. Uh, what this uh, guy did, uh, a study, John Barton with the Three Rivers Park District, he's a limnologist or a lake scientist, did a study on the effect of lawn soil compaction on lake water quality because he was finding there's his theory was all these lawns are so compacted they're acting like concrete and just letting the water flow off of them and then that's taking nutrients along with it into the lakes. What he was finding in a study of soils in the western suburbs of residential lawns that between 4 inches and 17 inches below the surface soils were so compacted they would not allow any root growth and then if you can't have root growth you can't have moisture penetration in. Uh, so you, you want to focus on, in those cases, loosening this, this layer, and that's caused from construction equipment on typically homes constructed after the 1980s. It still hasn't loosened up. So with soil compaction, uh, that greatly affects rooting depth of the turf grass or any plants that are above it. So again, you have a ton of water that could potentially be coming off of a relatively small uh, residential lawn. Easiest step to do to encourage deeper root growth is to raise the mow height up to three inches. That's where everybody should be at. Um, I grew up, so in the country, we had a, a, our lawn was a former pasture that our house got built on in the mid-70s. Super hard clay soils because it just got super compacted getting graded out. We had no irrigation system and my mom was the main mower for a while for me growing up and she was a scalper she would drop the mowing deck down to an inch because she wanted it to look like a golf course. But we had no irrigation system, super compacted soils. She'd mow like that in July or in August and it's super dry. The next day it'd be brown or two days later, completely brown. You know, she was killing it. Um, she just had control issues. We were like, you know, raise the deck up. We don't have to mow quiet as often. Uh, especially you don't have to mow when it gets dry outside. You can stop mowing because that lawn is so close to going dormant it gets additional stresses when you go out and mow it and create all this additional surface area where it can just lose moisture to the atmosphere. You don't want to cut it. So if you raise it to three inches, then in theory, uh, top growth is directly correlated to root growth on Kentucky bluegrass. You mow it at an inch, it can only support a one inch deep root system. You mow it at three inches, it can support a three inch deep root system if the roots can actually push down into the soil. So if you have a really a dry, dry soil area, you got sandy soils, and there's still a lot of sandy soil areas in Bloomington, uh, mowing it short is bad for sandy soils. You know, you want to mow that at three inches so it can extend down into the three inch area. So it reduces moisture loss, promotes deeper growth, or root growth, makes it more drought tolerant. Next step, so say you've got compacted soils, you use the wire flag to push into the lawn, and you can't push it in just even in the first inch. You get below the turf grass layer, it's rock hard. That's where you should be looking at the core plug aerator. You can get these at rental centers. Uh, and I do have down at the Isaac Walton League booth that's in the, the end of the hallway downstairs in the outside room or something it's called. Uh, I've got a list of contractors, of rental equipment places, um, all of this information uh, of where to get this stuff and, um, is down there. But you can, rent, you can rent the piece of equipment, and it's usually 60 bucks to rent it for like four hours, and you can be done in like two hours easily of the lawn. That pokes a, a, almost a three inch hole, about two and three quarter inch hole into the lawn, and then kicks up these plugs on the lawn and makes it look like a goose came and pooped over your yard. Eventually they break down, um, but it opens up these holes, punches through. The best time to do the aeration is in the fall. Second best time is to do it in May 1st to June 15th. You just want to do it when the soil is not really wet and not really dry, when it's sort of moist, so it can really puncture in to the full uh, extent. If you have any uh, irrigation system, you want to mark out those heads beforehand because this thing is pushing down with so much force, it's going to bust right through um, irrigation heads. And any shallow, other shallow um, utility lines, invisible dog fences, it'll punch right through those. The next best thing to do, you aerate and then top dress with the lawn with a compost, a thin layer of compost, a quarter inch thick. Uh, I'll show a slide on that. Uh, so that's the core plug aerators. Oh, I forgot to add on my rental um, down at intersection of uh, France and Old Shakopee. Um, there's that the hardware store down there that also rents. Um, I forgot to add them on my list. 
for the deeper aeration, and we can't get this yet in the residential field, but Toro makes this deep tine aerator that goes down to 16 inches to 18 inch depth. And that thing jams down these spikes and then shakes, physically shakes the soil to loosen it up. But like over in the city of Egan, this is what we use in our parks to go through in areas that have been super compacted just from foot traffic, that they run this thing through in the fall and it can just loosen soils back up again. It's quite the, quite the piece of equipment. Um, this is what leaf compost looks like, well-aged leaf and grass clipping compost. There's a couple of commercial sites that are sort of close to Bloomington. One is really at the, at the uh, landfill down in Burnsville, and that's on uh, one of the handouts that I have downstairs of where to get uh, well-aged compost. And the Shakopee Midwakanen just started a compost site that people can go and purchase compost there. A truckload of compost or a pickup load of compost is 10 bucks, 12 bucks. It's really cheap stuff, but it's weed seed free. Uh, they heat it to 150 degrees, so it kills off the weed seeds in it, kills off any E. coli or anything in it, so it's, it's uh, you're not bringing in anything bad. Uh, but it's all organic matter. It's, uh, it's, it's really good for the lawn. It's because uh, usually. Um, you can do this instead of doing a regular synthetic fertilizer. But another a good thing to do uh, in the spring, as soon as you can dig into the soil, is do a uh, soil sample and send it into the U of M to the lab uh, there. And I think I have the sheets downstairs uh, for the forms. Otherwise, you can go online and print them off. But it's like 15 bucks, something like that, to get a soil sample analyzed. And then that tells you really what your lawn needs for nutrients, so then you're not guessing. <coughs> I had, uh, my uncle was, um, he would always tell me, how do you take care of a lawn? You take, what it, you, you take what it says on the bag for how much to apply, you take that times four, and then you apply once a month during the summertime. A lawn can only take so much phosphorus, so much nitrogen, you know, any of those things, and then it just, it sheds the rest. It can't hold on to it. And so, uh, don't, I don't recommend anyone following Uncle John's lawn advice, but I always say, oh, you should really know about lawns. Uh, you're an accountant, you know, was the sort of background. But he had the same control issues that my mom had. Uh, he would scalp his lawn and just dump so much water onto it, and, oh, i got to go mow again. You know, you're doing that to yourself. You're over-fertilizing it. And, but anyway, compost is really cheap. You can, you can get a thin layer, like an eighth inch or a quarter inch layer on it. Um, and, and that uh, breaks down, goes into the soil, helps increase the organic uh, matter content of the soil because a lot of our soils are too low in organic matter content. There's contractors now that have these spreaders that then can come and spread compost on the lawn super fast. They're in and they're out. Uh, but it's, it applies a very even layer across the lawn. And I do have a list of companies down there too that it's on the green sheet, the lawn sheet, that uh, apply this, plus where you can get the compost and where you can buy uh, certain types of grass seed. One type, is the, the uh, little brand name is No Mow. Also, another name is Seldom Mow, but it's Fine Fescues. And so that's in your, in your handout. I think this specific slide is written down in there. Um, so Fine Fescue is the main thing you want to be looking for. No more Kentucky bluegrass. Kentucky bluegrass comes from that area when I showed that map of the United States in annual rainfall. It was grown a lot in the Kentucky area that gets four times, or uh, I take that back, three times as much annual rainfall as we get in Minnesota. It comes actually from Europe from an area that gets four times as much rainfall as we get in Minnesota. So here it's under drought stress almost all the time unless we're watering it or right after a rain. The fine fescues do come from an area in Europe but it's further north in Europe, more in line with Minnesota, and they are linked to our annual rainfall. This is just, it's way better uh, stuff to grow here. It works well on sands or clays, but if you got clay, you've got to reduce the compaction first. And it doesn't like heavy foot traffic, so if it's in a path, you say you have a path in the yard that's just, you can't get grass to grow, fescue isn't going to do it either. Um, that may be a switch to a mulch path or a gravel path or something. But the fine fescue, it's, it's really nice. It's self-weeding once it's established. It won't let dandelions within it. I seeded it at the place that I lived at, out at the Isaac Walton League, 10 years ago. Uh, so it, it has no dandelions growing in that area where it exists. Outside of the area where I got Kentucky bluegrass, I'm just full of dandelions. But it's also, it's called, some call it the no mow mix or the seldom mow mix because it just doesn't physically grow very tall. And so, like out at the Isaac Walton League, 
I would mow there once a summer. And then I would usually have to do that in mid-June. I'd mow it, and then it's done for the year. And I'd let it get three to four inches tall. But it's really nice stuff. You go into August, and we get dry. This stuff's still green. Because uh, it, it, once it's established, it has a root system that goes down 9 to 12 inches below the surface. In the city of Egan, we're starting to convert our center boulevard areas where we were previously having to mow a lot, converting those to the fine fescues, so then they can send a mower in there once a year and take care of it, and then we don't have to irrigate those areas. Another lawn substitute, yarrows, which is a typical garden plant. That can grow as a lawn, if you, but you have to mow it sort of regularly, every two to three weeks. Super drought tolerant. If you have heavy clay compacted soils, you can plant this stuff into it, and it loves those conditions. Out at the farm in South Dakota, this was the only thing that would be green after my mom mowed it an inch. We'd have these big patches of yarrow that was just growing out because it was a former pasture. It's awesome. It's super comfortable to walk on barefoot. It's like all these tiny little miniature ferns. But my brother and I would be running around in these areas in August uh, where it hurt to walk on the rest of the lawn. Clover lawns, those are also, there's these really short uh, growing clovers. They w work. You know, some people are just too freaked out about clovers. Of, That's a lawn weed. We don't want that. Yes? So for any of these, you have to, you have to remove your existing lawn or can you oversee? Uh, yeah, so the question is on uh, do you have to start from scratch or overseed. In the fescue case, if you want a true no-mow lawn or a reduced mowing lawn, you've got to kill off the Kentucky bluegrass. Because if the Kentucky bluegrass, if you don't mow, Kentucky bluegrass grows to 18 inches tall to the top of its seed head, and then someone from the city will come and visit you about a code in, issue. So if you, want, if you want to get to that point, you've got to kill off the lawn and then start from scratch. If, you don't, if you're going to still mow regularly or you know, want to pull it back to every two weeks or something like that, every three weeks during the summertime, you can overseed fescues into your Kentucky bluegrass lawn. The fescue works really well in the shade, you know, where Kentucky bluegrass won't grow well. So you can start seeding it into there. And I, I recommend that people, you know, get a, try out, buy a, like a pound of it, which is like five bucks for a pound of this stuff, which get, uh, I forget how much area that covers, 100 square feet, roughly a 10 by 10 area, maybe a little bit more. S s and just try an area in the, in the yard and experiment, see how it goes for you if you want to start converting the rest of the yard. Uh, but in the case of the, of the clovers, you should start from scratch. In the case of the yarrows, it's so aggressive. It, if you plug some of the yarrow in, it will take over over time. Yes? About the taller and coarse fescues in terms of tolerance. Um, the taller fescues can, can do it, but the, the fescues that are in this mix are all low-growing ones. But if you were blinding with it, yeah, yeah. If especially if the Kentucky bluegrass is struggling, then it's it's not going to be growing as much. Yeah, I I really like it. I now I just uh, we bought a house over by 90th and France area, sandy soils. I last fall I was overseeing fescues into it. I want to. I'm gonna so transition my lawn into the fescue. I couldn't, um, I wasn't, we had just had a baby. I wasn't ready at the time to take on a big yard project. But yeah, overseeding I think is a good, good way to, tr and to try it. You know, try it in an area of the yard and see what you think. Uh, diagram of root systems. Uh, so this is one foot increments over on the side. This is Kentucky bluegrass, has a two to three inch deep root system, three inches max. Uh, over in South Dakota, Nebraska, North Dakota, Kansas, they're starting to use this buffalo grass. It, it's too wet here to grow buffalo grass, but out there, because it, it likes low uh, precipitation, it's eight foot down there. So you get to August, this stuff doesn't even know that, there's been, that there hasn't been rain for a week or two weeks or a month. It's got access to moisture way down here. We would have that in areas of our pasture. You'd have a bunch of tall plants, you know, driving through, trying to find the cattle, and then you get to the spot that was just super short, that it would, it would just be this big colony of, of uh, buffalo grass. It was really nice, uh, nice looking stuff. It sort of has a greenish bluish, has a bluish tinge to it. Uh, rainfall map, this is from last year of where we were at. The yellow color is about four inches behind normal. This bluish color is, 
they were 16 to 20 inches above normal. But it's, there's these funky maps on, you can get online and see uh, precipitation changes over the years. Uh, so with compacted soils, we put turf grass on a life support system. We water so much. There's so much water that gets used for irrigating lawns. So this is Bloomington water usage over the course of a year from 2006. Um, typically using 300 million gallons of water per month of drinking water. Um, then it gets to the summertime, hops up to 800 million gallons of water per month, is sort of the peak. Late 80s, I think, is when it was up in, into this area where it really jumped up. We had a long dry spell. Where we get our water in Bloomington and in most of the suburbs areas, um, for about 400 feet to 1,000 feet below the surface in these really deep aquifers. This is really old water. It takes a long time for water soaking in again on the ground to ever make it down to these. We're just pulling out a lot. There's still, there's a lot of supply down there, but this is water. I just look at it, uh, this should be used for drinking. You know, I just have personal issues with it being used for lawn watering of this really old, very pretty clean water. We also get about 20% of our water in, during the summertime from the city of Minneapolis that they pull it out of the Mississippi. They have to go through quite a treatment process to make that drinkable. So with irrigation systems, it just makes me even sadder than when you have broken heads or ir uh, uh, heads that aren't adjusted very well or people watering the street or just a lot of just waste. And there's so much water uh, that's out there. So in this case, you know, they're, they're watering out. They just have the irrigation head just spinning completely around. They can go out and just do a very simple adjustment to get it to stop, you know, there so it's on the lawn. And, uh, there's rain sensors. If you have an irrigation system that is older than like 2002 or 2003 when, when they become, it became sort of mandated for a contractor installed irrigation systems, this little rain sensor, the top of it gets wet, it shuts off the timer so it doesn't water in the rain. There's still so many places and a lot of uh, down um, 84th and Normandale area, those big office towers, Every, it seemed like every time I would be driving home from work in the rain, boom, 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 you know, they're irrigating out into the, into the street as well, as well as just irrigating in the, in the rain. I called their property management company and left a voicemail saying, I, will, I have a wireless rain sensor I will give you, because Toro had given me a couple to sort of give away, um, and no, no call back. And then I, <sighs> just sad. Um, Toro also has, um, so there's all, all the other manufacturers have this stuff too, but Toro's recently come out with a lot of neat uh, new water conservation uh, uh, retrofits for irrigation systems. This has a uh, rain sensor on it plus a solar sensor, so it can tell how hot it is outside and that can then control or override this, the irrigation timer. They have, um, this is a soil monitor so this you push into the lawn, it sends a wireless signal back to this little box that gets wired into the irrigation timer that then if the soil is moist enough, it won't let the irrigation timer go off. This I think is really a good next step because we have those, the rain sensor, but oftentimes you can have the day after a rain and then the irrigation timer wants to go off and it, it's not controlling it and it's like, okay, go, you know, it's just, it's not raining at the moment. This one senses moisture. And so that pushes into the soil. It's got a six inch deep probe. And then that tells the irrigation timer when to go. It's, there's just all kinds of cool irrigation things happening now. Uh, drip irrigation systems, that's for plant beds. You don't want to do overhead watering on the plant beds. That can lead to uh, um, just fungus buildup on the, on the leaves. Drip irrigation, that's a line that's right on the ground. It's dropping water directly on the soil rather than spraying it into the air because you just lose so much uh, moisture um, sp spraying overhead. Whatever you do, avoid watering between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. because you can lose 50% of that water that sprays out is just gone into the atmosphere. Uh, whether it it's goes as it's being projected out into the air or once it lands on the lawn if it's sunny, it's just off before those plants can absorb it. Avoid watering on windy days because then it can just really blow it off of its target. Uh, and evaporation happens a lot in the wind. And then avoid overwatering, too frequent of watering. If you're watering every day or sometimes every other day, if the, if the soil doesn't, doesn't need it or can't take it, 
you're encouraging the, sh the roots to stay really shallow, to not try to move down to access moisture. Uh, so harvesting rainwater. So a typical rooftop can gather you know, 1,700 gallons of water, or it has 1,700 gallons of water shedding off in a one-inch rainfall. There's a lot of water coming off of each like, downspout location if you have downspouts. There's rain barrel systems. So this is then a rain barrel, two rain barrels. So this is 100 gallons of storage using a diverter, a downspout diverter. So it's a box that goes in line with the downspout, diverts the water into the barrels. Once they're full, they back up to the downspout line, and then the overflow goes through the downspout and goes away. It's a nice, safe system to take water offline um, compared to putting a rain barrel right in line with the downspout that the downspout hooks into. Because back to this diagram, off of this chunk of roof here, you can have 500 gallons coming off in a one inch rainfall. Those rain barrels hold 50 gallons a piece. It's gonna max it out really fast. Uh, if you had a downspout that was dumping right into the rain barrel, it takes its 50 gallons. What's gonna happen now with the other 455 or 500 gallons? If it, could, if it, if it maxes out the little overflow that's built into the rain barrels, it's gonna be bubbling over the top of the, of the barrel right next to a foundation. So the diverters are really nice insurance policy that it, you're not going to have any issues. Menards, that super Menards now that's in Eden Prairie is selling those diverters and they're like 50 bucks. But it's a nice little box. It also comes with a really nice um, spigot for the rain barrel that's a full, it's a uh, uh, wide open valve compared to a regular little spigot. You open a regular spigot up and it really restricts it down by two thirds of the water flow that comes through so it comes out so slow. This thing, you crank it open, it's wide open, it really pushes out a lot of water. This is an installation we did at the Egan Art House, so sort of like you know, uh, encouraging uh, community art, that it was a, a community art contest to paint the rain barrels. So we have those installed in tandem, so two next to each other and in two corners of the building. So we have 200 gallons of storage, but in, an 800, or in a one inch rain event, there's 800 gallons of water that's coming off of this uh, corner. This was at a, a residence in Egan. He wanted it to blend in, didn't want his neighbors to get freaked out you know, about having a bunch of barrels behind his house. But he has actually six barrels back here. So he has 300 gallons of storage. And you can only really see this one, but he painted it the same color as the siding to get it to blend. If you get a plastic barrel, first you need to apply a plastic primer paint to it to make that whatever paint you put on it stick. And you can get plastic primer paint at Menards or Home Depot, any of the hardware stores, in a spray paint can or there is a brush on, but the spray paint one works, it adheres better. But then you put that stuff on, and those, a lot of people use the primer and they have different colored primers, use that as the only coat they put on and that works. I've done that for eight years on mine. Uh, but otherwise, you want to stick on the primer and then put on, you use your house paint or your trim paint or whatever if you want it to blend. This is a system. These are 50-gallon tanks, but flat mounted. And these are underneath this deck. So they have 250 gallons of storage underneath the deck. You don't even see it. When they want to water, they have a little valve over on the side. They flick it off or flick it open and waters the plants. Larger cistern, so this is at a roadside uh, stop in Illinois. They capture the water, use it for irrigation. This is at a Walmart store. This is also in Illinois. They have, it's 15,000 gallons of water. This store is, it takes a rooftop runoff. This is at a Chipotle restaurant. They have a buried tank that takes uh, 2,000 gallons of water. And then they have a pump in it so that pulls that water out for their irrigation. This is at a Target store in Michigan that has a 30,000 gallon cistern on the rooftop or it takes rooftop runoff. They use that water for toilet flushing and then outside irrigation. Then this is it during construction. So in, in Egan, uh, we just had a meeting with a developer of a new retail space there. They're proposing putting in a 100,000 gallon tank uh, because then they, they're looking at their overall summertime water usage for irrigation. So they're planning on putting in a 100,000 gallon tank to take the rooftop water and then they won't have to purchase any city water for irrigation. City water is great for drinking. It's meant, that's what it's meant for. It's not meant for lawn watering. And so all of the nutrients in it, they're stripped out. You know, rainwater is way better for irrigation. Sometimes watering with lawn irrigation, or with, wait, excuse me, with drinking water uh, can help also wash out the nutrients in the soil. It just, because they're sort of mobile, move out. But uh, picking the plants for your condition. If you've got a really dry soils, 
you want to pick a plant that loves dry soils, and there's a lot of them that do. And in that little handout, and if for anyone who came in after we started, I have a little handout booklet up here. In the center of that booklet, it has a list, a list of plants, a very short list of plants that work for different situations. Like you have dry soils and sun, dry soils and shade, wet soils and sun, wet soils and shade. You want to match that up. Um, I've done it in the past of, I really wanted a very specific plant in a very specific spot and I didn't match up what its water needs were to what the site had. And so I put in a plant that loved a lot of water in a really dry site because it had red flowers and I really, really wanted those red flowers there. And I had to water it frequently and when I didn't, then it's, it's gone. And then I replaced it again and went through the whole process again and it was gone. And at that point then I decided I'm not going to do that again. Uh, that I, I'll pick a slightly different plant, but one that likes those conditions. There's different uh, plant nurseries around. Uh, I really like the native plants because they're adapted to living here, but there's a lot of regular garden perennials that are just really good in uh, dry conditions or wet conditions, you know. But uh, one company, and this is on one of the handouts that I have downstairs, this prairienursery.com, they have a great catalog that has all the plants organized by soil type and moisture. So here they have a list of clay busters, um, and other plants for medium soil. So if you have really heavy clay soils, there are certain plants that love clays and they help loosen up the clay soils because they have a really strong root system. Over here they have plants for dry, sandy, and rocky soils. But they'll have just pages of options within this category. There's also another really good book. This is my favorite one, this Landscaping with Native Plants in Minnesota, and that's referenced in the little handout guy that's in the center section. Uh, that's uh, author is Lynn Steiner. She's over uh, in the Stillwater area. And it's a, it's a great book with great plant lists. They have great lists in there. Native plants of the deciduous forest. See, these are trees that would grow underneath shade. Uh, native plants for shade gardens. Then they also have uh, plants for under conifers, evergreens. These are, you know, people say, oh, I try to grow grass underneath it. Nothing will grow underneath my evergreen, my spruce tree. There's a lot of plants that will grow underneath it. Kentucky bluegrass won't do it, it's too acidic. Uh, but it's, you know, just picking the right plants for the right situation. Oh, I got too much stuff and I want to wrap up. Um, strawberries, little wild strawberries, woodland strawberries, awesome little ground cover. They get about six inches tall. They form a really nice carpet. They're great in the shade uh, or in just semi-shade, but a really nice area for a ground cover. And you get little fruits off of them that are very tasty. They're very sugary. Very nice, a dwarf bush honeysuckle, really underutilized in the residential landscape plant that gets about 24 inches tall. It's really drought tolerant, but it's also very, very wet tolerant. It's real versatile and it works well in the shade. It really works well in the shade and works well in the sun. But it, you know, two feet tall, really nice plant, super low maintenance. Uh, observe this. You have a wet area too soggy to mow plant it to something else. You know, if you're burying the mower in one area of the yard because it's so wet, maybe think about some other planting. Uh, I got too much stuff. This, I'm going to just show you very quickly. Uh, well, why we get all caught up about phosphorus and what's ha why are the lakes green? There's too much phosphorus, so a naturally occurring nutrient, but it was in fertilizer for a long time. It's in soil particles. It just moves attached to things. It dumps in the water bodies and then algae can use it really fast. It just takes one pound of phosphorus runoff to make 500 to 1,000 pounds of algae. So a little bit of phosphorus that gets dumped into a water body goes a long way to making a big mess. Uh, so rain gardens work well, this little rain garden. There's another class later today about rain gardens. And so that's a whole other thing that I didn't quite touch on, but there's information in the little booklet. This is a rain garden that was done for 80 bucks off of the corner of a house. It captures 300 gallons of water and then it helped improve the health of the plants around it too. But you wanna, there's, there's a lot of keys to doing rain gardens, keeping them at least 12 to 15 feet away from the foundation of the house. Um, yeah, and it's in the handout. All right, any other, any questions that I could take right now? Or I'll be down at the booth, at the Isaac Walton League booth, at the very end of the hallway in, that, in the outdoor room from now until noonish. All right. Yes. So do you know if there's ways to use like rain barrels that is there a way to attach some water from the rain barrel to use in your sprinkler system? 
Um, the, uh, the question is, is there a way to attach the rain barrel to use that water in the sprinkler system? Um, there is, but I don't think there's enough water contained within those rain barrels. You would, if you want to use it for lawn irrigation, I would st then step up to a uh, cistern, you know, that then is going to be 500 gallons to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 gallons, because the irrigation system goes through so much. The rainwater also, you would want to run through quite a filter system before it went into your irrigation system, because the heads can get plugged uh, with, with the stuff that's just coming off the roof or just particles that are in, in the, with, the, with the rainwater. There's, uh, you can hook, it, hook up the rain barrels to a drip irrigation line, uh, to a, one with an actual physical hole drilled in the line, run that through the plant beds, and then open it up. And then that's what a lot of people are using them for, irrigating plant beds around. They hook up the hose to it. And then all you do to water is flip the lever, and then you walk away, and then you wait and then shut off the lever when it's drained down. You don't have to use pitchers you know, to move it around. Try to think also where you're putting rain barrels. Where is it going to be the most convenient location for you to get access to them? Or where, the, where is a plant bed that you want to add water to or have the irrigation system? I put mine initially, the first barrel I did, um, in a very inconvenient spot. And so I had, it was so far away from where I was trying to water plants that then I kept w running water pitchers back and forth. And lesson learned. But all right. Thank you very much.